today we have a very special guest and I'm super excited to introduce for our special business and leadership edition of continuing academic and enrichment community reads program. I'd like to introduce John Cox. Hello, John. How are you today? Good, Nicole. How are you? Doing great. So John Cox is Vice President of Government Affairs at Rocky Mountain Power. He previously served as a member of the Utah House of Representatives, San Pete County Commission, and was a staff member for both Utah Governor Gary Herbert and former U.S. Senator Bob Bennett. He is a former assistant professor of history at Snow College and an instructor of Utah history at the University of Utah. Join me in welcoming John Cox today. That's quite the resume, John. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, no mention of SUU, uh, so I, you'll forgive me for that. But my father did work at SUU Ouch. for 10 years, so hopefully yes, I sneak in. Yeah. <laughs> What's your dad's name? Remind me what your dad's name is again. Uh, so my dad, is uh, his name is Neil Cox. So he's Neil retired Cox. now, but, uh, but spent about a decade there at SUU. Okay, well then you're covered. You're totally good. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you, you covered. So give us some of your background. Where did you grow up? Uh, so I, I grew up uh, initially in uh, Ephraim, Utah, so San Pete County. And uh, my family uh, moved away when I was in junior high and uh, moved to Chicago, Illinois. So I, I lived in Chicago for, for three years. Two of those years were the, the, the two years that the Jazz and the, the Bulls played each other in the, the NBA Finals. So I've Really oh, who were struggling. you rooting for? Well, of course, the Jazz. I, I had a John Stockton jersey I would wear to school. Um, it, 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 this new Michael Jordan documentary, I, I really had a hard time watching, but it's uh, a little too close to home. But uh, after that, my family moved uh, to, uh, to Parowan, uh, actually. So that's when my dad uh, took a job at SUU. And so I, I graduated high school uh, from Parowan High School. Oh, that's a huge leap from Chicago to Parowan. How was that adjustment for you? Uh, it was great. I, I love Parowan High School. It's, a, it's an amazing place. I, I couldn't have picked a better spot. Uh, so my graduating class, there was 51 kids in my graduating class. And, uh, you know, it's one of those situations where you get to do a little bit of everything. Uh, not that dissimilar from a lot of small schools in, in Utah. You, you play basketball, you play football, and then they make you do the play or the school play and everything <laughs> else in between. Just involved in everything. Yep, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So where did you end up going to school? I mean, after you did the high school, where did you go to college? Yeah, so I, I went to, to Snow College and then, then on to, to Utah State. And uh, that's where I graduated from my undergrad. And then I got a graduate degree uh, from the University of Utah. University of Utah. Okay. And I hear that you are into history. That's your thing. So how did you get involved in history that interests you? You're a history professor. Yeah, so, uh, and that's not what I do uh, currently, but yeah, I, I did work at Snow College for about four and a half years as a, as a history professor. I, uh, I, I didn't uh, study history as an undergrad. I, I took a, a graduate program from the U uh, just as a, uh, an evening program. I was working full time for Senator Bennett, uh, at the time Senator Bob Bennett uh, in Salt Lake, and uh, had always had an interest in history and uh, an opportunity presented itself at Snow College. Snow is a very small institution. Um, they've got uh, two uh, history professors, one who's uh, the U.S. history professor, the other is sort of the world history professor. Now, I think they've grown since I've left, but, but at the time it was just two. <laughs> and uh, the, the U.S. history uh, professor was retiring after 42 years, and uh, you know, that was my one shot, so it worked out really well. So your one shot. And you also worked for Bob Bennett, you said. How was that? Did you live in Utah and work for Bob Bennett, or did I, you... I did both. Back east? Yeah, so I, I started, uh, I worked for him, uh, I, I just did an inter internship for him uh, while I was in college uh, in Washington, D.C., and uh, when I graduated, uh, there was a position that opened up for him uh, in, in his Utah office, and so I spent most of my time uh, working there in his, his Salt Lake City office. Oh, okay. So was that where you got your interest in politics? I'm wondering, how did you go from a history professor to politics? Was that kind of your in? Yeah, I think so. I, I always had an interest in, in uh, politics. And um, yeah, I mentioned Perro in high school, you know, you did the student government thing. But again, not because you're maybe so into politics, but there was just not many other people maybe to, to choose from there. So I, uh, I was involved, I guess, in that, that, that lens, but I didn't do a whole lot. And uh, yeah, the opportunity presented itself. And, and I, I took that internship. And that's where it really kind of started. But I, I've always had an interest in politics. 
Um, my, my mom would always say that I was uh, you know, born a contrarian. So I always like to sort of challenge certain things and, and politics is a good- The so politics were just meant for you then. Yeah, I worked at- <laughs> <laughs> I should just think that with my kids. Such a contrarian, oh, politics. That's where they're gonna <laughs> there you go. go. You were appointed to state legislature after Spencer Cox became Governor Herbert's Lieutenant Governor, and then they appointed you in that state legislature. How was that for you to go from working from Bob Bennett and then the history and then state legislature? What was that like? Yeah, so so the the state legislature and, and Utah it's a part time position, and so I, I continued to work at Snow College while I, I served in the legislature. Um, it it uh, they had a, a special election to replace uh, Spencer, uh, and so when I ran for that, there was uh, two other candidates in that race. Uh, Great, great candidates and, and great friends. Uh, I was a county commissioner at the time, and, and it was one of my fellow county commissioners who ran, and then a, a mayor from one of our, our bigger cities there in the county. And so, anyhow, it's uh, it was a great experience. I enjoyed working uh, there in the legislature. Uh, it's uh, you know 45 days where you're working nonstop, you know, living uh, away from home, away from family, and uh, you know it, it was a great experience. Something that I, I certainly uh, enjoyed and. You know, for a junkie like me who really just loves politics, um, it was great because I was right in the middle of it and they even let you vote, you know, like what, what could mm. be better? <laughs> and that was my next question with your family. Did you end up commuting a lot? Did you live up in Salt Lake half the time? How does that work with family? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I you know, rented a little room uh, in Salt Lake City and, and lived there uh, throughout the week. I'd come home on on weekends, um, it, it was a little bit different during the different times I served. So initially, um, it was just my wife and I, and we had just a, a young baby, and so uh, she came up as well. Uh, toward the end of my service, we, we had actually uh, adopted two other uh, children who were older, uh, a six and a four-year-old. So they were, especially the six-year-old, had school. And so I, I was away for fam uh, from family, um, as are many legislators. So you have you know, legislators mm -hmm. in, in Southern Utah do the same thing. You know, they, they move up to Salt Lake City essentially for 45 days and, and have a great experience. But when those 45 days are up, they're certainly happy to, to come back home and, and be with family. Right, right. So you go from state legislature and then you start working as staff for Governor Herbert. So what did you do for him? Yeah, so I, I worked, uh, I was his, his spokesperson um, and, and worked on his senior staff on, on a host of issues. So Governor Herbert, uh, at the time was uh, chair of the, the National Governors Association. So we, we jokingly like to call it uh, the governor of the governors. I don't, I don't think it really works like that. But uh, <laughs> so, so there was a lot of uh, work obviously in state, but then a lot of things that he was doing on, on a national level. Um, you know, th there's certain moments in, in history that um, y you remember a little bit better because you were you were in the middle of some of those things. And, and there was a few mm -hmm. of those instances there certainly working for for Governor Herbert, and and uh, you know, I, I have tremendous respect for for the folks in those seats. It's it's a pretty high high burn rate. It's uh, it's a twenty four seven job. I I don't know how he does it. He'll, he'll uh, by the time he leaves, he'll he'll be uh, finished from office at the end of this year. Uh, he'll be the second longest serving governor in in state history, and you know that's it's a lot of work. And I uh, I certainly admire him yes. and, and all his team. Off the top of your head, who's the longest running governor? Who has served the longest? Yeah, so the, the longest serving governor was uh, Cal Rampton. So Cal Rampton was elected to, to three terms, so he served for 12 years. Uh, governor Herbert uh, served the, the remaining portion of John Huntsman's term. So John Huntsman left. Oh, that's uh, right. I'd forgotten six that. Six to, was, I think he, they announced it in May. I think he left, I want to say August uh, of 2009. So he left just really sort of eight months into that first term. So Governor Herbert served the, the remainder of that term and then was elected to two others. So Governor Herbert had almost three full terms, but, but, but not quite. Right. How many terms can you serve as a governor? Is there a limit? Not in the state of Utah. So a lot of states, they, 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 they do have ter term limits. In the state of Utah, we don't. Um, uh, but, but even with that, it's, it's interesting that, you know, very rarely do you see a, a governor serve, you know, even, again, the three terms. Uh, the, the third longest mm -hmm. serving governor was Governor Levitt. Uh, he got elected to a third term, but, uh, but left midterm. Uh, for an appointment in, in Washington, D.C. in the, the Bush administration. So I, I think the, oh, yeah. the nature of being a chief executive, it's pretty hard to, to last, uh, you know, more than uh, one, one term for one two. Oh, especially what's going on in today's day and age. I bet he's so glad that he's not <laughs> running again this year with COVID. I mean, it's kind of a tough election year, I think, with all this, because you can't make anybody happy either way. So yeah, um, no, it's true. 
it's hard to predict um, sort of what what's going to happen. I um, there, there's one story, and I know we'll get to the book later. But I, I mentioned one story in in, in the book about um, I forget the year. I think it was like 1950s, 1957. I think it was that the governor of Utah he just had taken office the month before. And uh, all of a sudden we had the biggest prison riot in Utah history. So 500 inmates at the point of the mountain prison rioted, they took over the prison. So the inmates are running the prison. And uh, at the same time, there was actually a, a church basketball game going on at the prison. So some inmates were playing <laughs> the, the Granger second ward. And uh, so- so That's a great the, story. <laughs> yeah, so the members of, of this basketball team, the Granger second ward church basketball team, were all held hostage overnight. So for 12 hours are held hostage while the governor is trying to negotiate a release for, uh, with these inmates. And it's a great example of, of I think what governing is like. You, you go in, you have a plan, you're doing things you wanna do, and then something comes out of left field. It can be you know, a prison riot, it can be a global pandemic, you know, whatever. And uh, you, you just have- Basketball players being held hostage. <laughs> what year was that? That's crazy. Uh, that was, I wanna say it was 1957. So the, the governor was uh, Governor George Clyde and he had just been put into office uh, the year before. Yeah, 1957. And he was probably done. I'm not running ever again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, he was here for a little while. But uh, you know, it's not that dissimilar. I mean, uh, you know, on a national level, you, you think through some 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 recent history or or even longer term history, like uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. You know, he ran. He wanted to be this person that did this war on poverty. That's what he ran on. That's what he was going to do. And then all of a sudden, you're in the Vietnam War, and 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 you, you can't. You don't have the resources to do do those other things. And so sometimes you can predict what's going to occur. A lot of times, you can't. And and you need good people in those offices that that are able to respond in the moment. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's a really good lead into your book. If you'll hold up your book and show us what it looks like. Yeah, I have to. This is the book we're going to be discussing today, Utah Politics, Principles, Theories, and the Rules of the Game. And really quick, before I go into the synopsis, do you feel like there's rules of the game in Utah politics? Does it seem <laughs> I, that I way? Remember, I, I, I wrote the book, so I got to make them up, I guess. But uh, I, I think that Utah is a, a very unique place in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's certainly mm -hmm. unique when it comes to politics. And, and I think, you know, the best example that we see of that is um, congressional races, so sort of national races that, that are here in Utah. And, and I, it happens at least every couple of years, but you'll, you'll have a, a campaign uh, that's going on. It's a competitive race. And then sort of the national parties decide they want to get involved. And so they'll send out some consultants or they'll try to run some ads and they're not allowed to coordinate with the campaigns. And so they're just sort of doing this in isolation and they just end up running the same kind of ads that they run in every other state and they never work in Utah, you know? So they're the really blistering, angry attack ads and uh, Utahns just don't, don't respond to that <laughs> very well. And yes. So it's, a, it's a different place. Well, I wondered that because I noticed that sometimes at the end of these runs for the political seats that they'll get really mudslingy. And it doesn't seem that way at the beginning. Is that because they bring in other people near the end to kind of help them at the end and then they just kind of start running those kind of ads for Utah? Is that what happens? Sometimes, sometimes it can be you're, you're behind. And that's your only chance to win is you got to tear down the other person, mm -hmm. which is un unfortunate. And, and sometimes, you know, we like to say that negative attacks don't work. You know, sometimes they do, but, but they, they usually are presented in a way that um, are not so blatant. You know, the, the types of mm -hmm. attacks that I'm talking about are, are really just sort of the, the over the top, you know, here's two sides of the same coin and here's this national politician that you hate and here's this other local person that, that, that uh, you, you don't know that you hate yet. And, and, and they just don't really work in Utah. So in, in history, there's a, a historian uh, of the American West that uh, in, in talking about the West, uh, she, she spoke of what she called the, the donut theory, this idea that, you know, you can talk about the West and, and people respond or people are a certain way uh, and, and we can talk about what those are, you know, very liber libertarian, you know, sort of uh, uh, pe people that uh, are standing up for themselves, you know, doing their own thing. Um, but, but within the West, there's sort of this donut hole that, that doesn't really fit the rest of the West. And, and that really is Utah. If you look at the, you know, even the settlement of Utah, it's just very different than the rest of the West. If you look at sort of the culture of Utah, it's very different than the rest of the West. Mm -hmm. And I think that plays out uh, certainly in politics as well. Yes, definitely. Well, reading your synopsis, Utah is a peculiar place and Utahns are a peculiar people. Men overwhelmingly dominate Utah business and politics, but it was also the first state in the nation where women cast a vote 
and is home to the nation's first female state senator. Now, I want to ask you, who's that first state senator? And she had to beat out her husband for the seat. Like, who is this? And what year was that? Yeah, so that was, uh, if I get my, my dates right, I think it was 1896. That was Martha Hughes Cannon. So uh, she was the first ever female state senator uh, in, in the nation, and it was right here in Utah. Uh, she's actually so- In the every, 1800s? Yeah, so, so this is before women had the right to vote in most states. So the 19th Amendment doesn't oh, occur wow. until so much later. Uh, it, it's interesting, every state, if you go to DC, if you go to the Capitol, um, every state gets two statues uh, in the Capitol building. They're located in different places. And uh, Utah's two statues have historically been uh, a statue of Brigham Young and then a statue of Philo T. Farnsworth, the inventor of the television. And uh, the state legislature here in Utah actually just changed that a couple years ago. And uh, they've got a new statue coming that, that will change. And so they're, they're moving out Mr. Farnsworth and uh, Martha Hughes Cannon will be the new statue in the Capitol. So the first ever female state Aww. senator. If you ever go to DC, you'll be able to see her, you know, as one of two Utahns uh, there, there in statue. Oh, that is awesome. So how did that, because she had to beat out her husband for that, how did that marriage turn out? Was the husband okay? <laughs> like, you go, girl, or was, was that a little bit tricky? Yeah, I, I, it's, it obviously worked out for her and uh, it worked out for the state as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's one where there's other examples too. You know, you're, you're in Southern Utah there uh, in, in Cedar City. Uh, in, in I want to say it was 1911, uh, they had the first ever all-female city council in America occurred in uh, the city of Kanab or the town of Kanab. And, uh, you know, you, you get lots of interesting stories then uh, about what they did in office as well. So Utah, I think that we, we look at current leadership in the state and current numbers of an involvement and, and they are uh, tilted towards, towards men. And, and, I, and I, I wish that was something that would change. I hope it is something that changes. But if you look at our history, um, there, there are some, I think, really proud moments where, where women uh, ran for office and, and led uh, the state in, in troubled times. And, and you know, those are just a few examples. Mm -hmm. And Utah was the first state to allow women to vote? So the, the first correct? state to uh, allow women to vote was, was actually Wyoming, but Utah Wyoming, did it just okay. right after. And Utah, we had an election before Wyoming did. So the first woman who actually cast a ballot was in Utah. Uh, because of just the timing of the elections. And what year was that? How long ago was that? 1800s oh, again? That was a long time ago. I, I know. <laughs> and what not so good with my dates. Not so good with my dates. That was a long time ago. Uh, Utah, uh, if you go back and try to try to look at the dates when women were granted the right to vote, um, you, you'll get it at two different times. One uh, was, was the first time they were allowed the right to vote uh, under the Edmonds Tucker Act, which uh, tried to go after polygamists in the state, uh, the, the federal government actually revoked women's right to vote in Utah for a period of time. Uh, and then when we went through our constitutional convention uh, in 1896, they, they got the right to, to, to vote again. Uh, if you go to the state capitol um, and, and, and ever go watch the legislature in action, um, you, you'll notice if you're in the gallery, just sort of looking up, there's a few uh, murals uh, there at the very, very top of, of the, the uh, sort of building where, where they're housed. And uh, one of those murals is that uh, individual, Seraph Young was her name, who was the, the first ever uh, female uh, to, to cast a, a ballot. So she was just a young school teacher in Utah and uh, went early in the morning because she had to go teach class later, later in the day. And, and she was the first one to, to cast a, a ballot. Oh, that's amazing. Well, your book is a comprehensive history of Utah politics, and there are so many interesting stories that you have in there. But what I'm curious is what motivated you to want to write this book about Utah politics? Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I think anyone who likes to write um, uh, obviously loves to read. And, and so I think, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, I, I love to read about politics. I love to, to read about uh, Utah. I've got a uh, a, a young nephew uh, who uh, he, he calls me Uncle Utah, doesn't call me Uncle John, calls me Uncle Utah. <laughs> I, I feel that's like nice. you know, that's, uh, that's a good sign that, that uh, you know, I'm on brand, uh, I guess. But I, yeah, uh, that's good. Yeah, and my kids give me a hard time too. Um, it, you know, any book on Utah history or Utah politics, whatever, you know, I, 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 I own it. You know, some, some Amazon booksellers sold it and I'm, I'm their best customer. So anytime there's a rectangularly shaped, you know, a cardboard box coming in the mail, my kids give me a hard time that it's another, another book about Utah. So I, I've always just been interested in it and I, I love to read about it. So part of this uh, really just came from reading a lot. And, and as I read, I, you know, I'll, I'll 
write some notes as, as I go along. And, and, and after a while, you start to have a little bit of a repository of notes and, and you think, you know, hey, maybe I could find a way to sort of put this together. So by no means is the book exhaustive, but uh, there's, there's perhaps just a few, few lessons I've learned along the way and, and certainly look forward to, to learning a lot more in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. When you were researching for this book and getting these different stories together, what surprised you the most? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, sort of the, the diversity of, of experiences out there. The, the, the other thing, too, that I mentioned throughout the book is I'll, I'll try to do like little rules or, you know, principles, whatever, uh, throughout the book. And, and I give them names just based on some random experience in Utah history. Um, but, but then you'll, you'll notice I, I'll, I'll do another one that almost feels contradictory or, or very different. And, and I, I think what's very interesting in, in Utah politics is sort of this equilibrium that we have where, you know, we don't want you to be mean, but, you know, maybe don't be too nice either. You know, you stand up for yourself sort of thing. And so there, there, are, there are instances, I think, uh, throughout our history where, um, you know, we, we, we bounce around a, a little bit, but I, I think there are some threads there that can be drawn. And I, I think they are mm -hmm. broader or bigger threads uh, that, that speak to our, our culture as a state. Uh, but even within that, there's diversity within that. I, you know, we, we tend to tell the story of our state as, uh, you know, uh, pioneers come west, you know, seeking refuge from religious persecution. And, and there were a lot that did, you know, including my, my ancestors. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but there's a lot that came in, in other ways. So, you know, you look at uh, Carbon County and the founding of Carbon County is very, very different than, than the founding of Sampy County, where I'm from, just over the mountains. So Carbon County, uh, one historian called it the Ellis Island of Utah because all the people that came to Carbon County came from countries all over the world, you know, predominantly for mining purposes. And, uh, you know, you had people from, from every country you could ever imagine. Well, well, that kind of culture that's created in that environment is very different, you know, um, mm -hmm. than, than the culture that we have, you know, just over the mountain again in San Pete. Uh, the culture you have, even the political culture you have in Southern Utah is very different than what you have along the Wasatch Front. And uh, so I, there's a, a diversity of experiences there. I certainly, can't capture all of that in, in just one book, but I, you know, tried to give a little bit of a flavor to that. Yes, yes. Well, I had a question from a really interesting one that I thought, uh, Utahns drink less alcohol than any other state in the nation, thanks in no small part to the state's predominant faith, which prohibits its use. And yet Utah was the deciding state that repealed prohibition against the public wishes of Heber J. Grant, who was the prophet of the church at the time. I did not know that. What? what's <laughs> i would be like whoa wait what <laughs> that doesn't sound like utah to me so what's the background of that story yeah no i mean that's that's the 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 gist of it and 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 it's not necessarily that that utah was uh you know an imbibing state or anything of that nature at that point in time but uh but ultimately sort of we we'd been through this uh experience with with prohibition and and you'd seen quite a few states that felt like it wasn't successful and uh and obviously to repeal, a losing war yeah exactly to, to repeal a constitutional amendment you know it still takes uh, mm -hmm. a significant majority of states to, to 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 ratify that and so um you know utah was was one of them and and that came even to, despite the the po uh, political or, or the, the public opposition of of the leader of of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints in that case you know we we think that's a little surprising today because we don't see uh, leaders of, of predominant faiths here in the state sort of step out into the, the public policy space, but that hasn't always been the case. And in fact, you know, there, there's mm -hmm. many instances in, in the history of the state where, where they did take positions, sometimes in opposition to each other, you know, so it's uh, over time, uh, the, the political culture of the state can change just like religious culture can or, or other things as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So John, how long did it take you to write this book? Yeah, so like I said, I mean, I, I collect uh, a lot of stories over time, and uh, and, and as you do that, uh, you, you sort of build out that repository. So if you include all of that, you know, it's a significant period of time. If if you include just the the time period of me sort of writing and and refining and and you know putting together the actual book itself, it's probably a you know six mm -hmm. six to nine month process. Oh, okay. Well, that's pretty quick, actually. Sometimes I talk to people and they're like, oh, it was like 10, 13, 15 years. And I'm like, oh, I don't think I could stick with anything for that long. But six <laughs> to nine months. 
And Smith, yeah. that's really impressive for a history buff, and that's a lot of stuff to research. So you must really love it. Yeah, one of the, the best little, uh, you know, tips, it worked for me. Everybody's different as far as how they like to write. But obviously, half the battle is just, just putting in the effort. I mean, it takes a lot of follow through to, to do some of these things. But, uh, you know, for me, what was really helpful, my, my, uh, my wife uh, got me uh, a gift uh, for Christmas. And it was like this really, really old school. You can't buy them new. It was some old school, like typing pad that didn't connect to the internet. And uh, it, it's very helpful for me. I, I, I get distracted easily, I'm sure, just like everyone else. It was very helpful for me to have this sort of document in front of me that, uh, or this, this keypad in front of me that I could type it out. I wasn't going to get distracted with emails or whatever else. And, and with that... Emails, Facebook updates, Messenger. Yeah. I get distracted so easy. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Goodreads. What's everyone reading? Yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time keeping focus. If you can, you know, for 30 minutes a day, distraction-free, you know, take some time to do something, you, you can get, get a lot out uh, pretty quickly. The, the other challenging part is obviously the, the refining process and, and editing and and, and uh, you know, that, that's probably the, the hardest part of all is, is making sure it, it all connects and, and makes sense. And thankfully, you know, I had, had good people around me that helped uh, throughout that process as well. Mm -hmm. Is Utah a peculiar state when it comes to its politics more than any other states, do you think, with your experience on the political scene? It seemed very unique. Yeah, it, it's very unique. It's always hard to, to rank states, but uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little biased because I've lived in Utah for so long. And in my professional life, you know, I, I work a lot as well in other Western states. I spend a lot of time in, in uh, Idaho and, and Wyoming, and uh, and they have unique things about their state as, as well. You know, that are that are very very different. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I would say U Utah is is right right up there. I think the things that make us unique you know, can, can be traced back, you know, sometimes uh, in part to, to sort of where we came from, our, our people, who are we? Uh, but, but even today, you know, you look at the state uh, today, our economy in, in Utah is different than the economy in Wyoming. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, our economy today is very different than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, the, the other lesson I think that I learned in, in writing this book is, um, you know, you you write a, something, you call it Utah politics, you're putting some rules down. Uh, and and frankly, you know, evolutionary things can can change those quite quickly. And and, and honestly, with COVID-19, sometimes some revolutionary things can hit you. And, and, you know, will that change our culture? Will that change our politics? You know, time will tell. Yes. So with COVID-19, do you think we're ever going to get normal again? Or do you think we've forever changed? <laughs> so what are your opinions on that? <laughs> I think we'll get back to normal. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pollyanna kind of guy. So I, I think we'll get back to normal. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take some time and, and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm hopeful at some point in time, you know, I, I don't think it's anytime soon, but at some point in time, I'm hopeful we'll get a vaccine. Um, and, and if so, I think that will be a great day, you know, for our country. There's mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the psychologists talk about this, uh, this rule, they call it the peak end rule. And uh, they, they talk about our memories and how we remember things. And you remember them based on sort of the, the peak emotion, good or bad, that you had. And then you remember them based on how it ended. And I, I think that we've got a decent feel for some of the peak, or at least we think we, we know what some of the, the peak is. And it's, it's pretty significant. You know, it's something my, my kids think about, they talk about a lot. What we don't know yet is, is how it ends. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that, you know, our, our folks in, in the scientific community can come up with a solution. But I, I think if so, you know, that will be a tremendous relief to, to one day, you know, have this behind us and we'll always remember it, but I, I, I'm hopeful it's, it's not with us to stay. Right. Oh, it's the unknown. That's just so, so scary. You were the Sound Pete County Commissioner and, you know, these county commissioners are dealing with this COVID. I mean, you're not in the spot anymore, but do you have any advice for any of these county commissioners dealing with COVID? Yeah, no, they, they're, they're, uh, they're great people. I, uh, I've got tremendous respect for them. I, I know one of the, the county commissioners there in Iron County, uh, his, his son and I were, were close friends in high school and I, I just think the world of him. But I, uh, yeah, I, I, when I was on the Sanpete County Commissions, every commissioner, you know, you, you cover all the issues, but you, you usually assign one county commissioner to a certain set of tasks. And uh, the, the task I was assigned to, uh, among many others, was public health. And I would go to the meetings every month and <laughs> You know, you, you go to the meetings and, and you're kind of wondering, okay, you know, how, how important is this? We're talking about the, you know, the swimming pool checkup, making sure, you know, everything's okay. Or, you know, the, you're inspecting a restaurant, making sure there's no health code violations. But really, 
Like it just didn't seem like that big of a deal. And then out of nowhere, you know, there's, it's there's a huge nothing deal. more important. Yeah, it's the most important thing out there. And so I, I, I always admire anybody who is willing to to put their name out there and and serve and and you know fight in the arena. That's the old Teddy Teddy Roosevelt quote. Um, I, I think that. Uh, there's a lot of us out there that aren't in the middle of the arena that, that like to be critical and like to maybe armchair quarterback it a little bit. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> That's it, a good term. <laughs> yeah. But but anybody if I was doing it, it would be like this. Yeah, exactly. And 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 in in hindsight, it's it's easy to do that. But but when you're there in the moment with incomplete information, sort of the fogs of war in front of you, um, you know, I, I think we have tremendous leaders here in the the state of Utah, and that certainly goes for our county leaders as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you left working for Governor Herbert and now you are the, let's see, the Vice President of Government Affairs at Rocky Mountain Power. What does that mean? That's an impressive title, but I was like, but I don't know what it means. So, so what do you do for Rocky Mountain? Yeah, so, so we are uh, an electric company. We, we provide service uh, throughout the, the, the Western United States. So um, at Rocky Mountain Power, we have uh, customers uh, throughout much of, much of Utah. We, we serve uh, Cedar City, but but not, uh, not necessarily all of Cedar City. I mentioned I'm from Parowan. Parowan mm -hmm. actually has its own uh, municipal power system, so it's a little bit different there. Oh, it does? But, yeah, but we, uh, we have 1.9 million uh, customers. We have a, a broad fleet of uh, coal plants, natural gas plants, wind farms, solar farms. Uh, we got a little geothermal farm uh, there in Southern Utah as well, one of the first ones ever developed in the United States. Um, so, so yeah, my, my business is, is the business of energy and uh, trying to keep Keep the lights on and, and keeping uh, you know prices affordable and, and trying to, to also create a, a cleaner energy supply uh, for folks moving forward. So how has that looked with COVID and your job? Does that look a lot different than it did? Are you having to conduct business differently? How does that look with the energy with all this COVID stuff yeah. going on? Yeah, no, it's it's an interesting interesting time. Um, some of our customers you know, are, are certainly using less electricity. So that, that uh, impacts our workforce um, and, and, and our company. We're, we're dealing with that as well. But, but a lot of what we do, you know, you think about uh, what goes into keeping your, your lights on uh, on a given day. And, 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 and those people can't, can't work from home. You know, they, they can't take the day off. And, you know, in, in the middle of all this, we also had a, an earthquake up in, in Salt Lake City. And, oh, like multiple earthquakes. Yeah, we had quite a few, but... <laughs> When it rains, it pours. Let's just yeah. throw in an earthquake with an epidemic. Our, okay. <laughs> our CEO likes to do uh, lots of sort of tabletop exercises of planning and what would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? So we, we do this all the time, but we, we joke that, you know, if you would have, if he would have said that, hey, okay, here's the scenario. There's a global pandemic. And in the middle of the global pandemic, there's this massive earthquake and 70,000 customers are out of power. We would have, we would have laughed at him and said, you know, okay, let, let's try to be a little more realistic. You know, that's, that's not going to happen. But, uh, but yeah, we, we've got our folks out there. It happened. Yeah, we've got line workers uh, every day out there, you know, fixing, mm -hmm. fixing bowls, fixing wires. Uh, we've got folks, uh, again, in our generation facilities. Um, th those are people that you never see. I mean, sometimes you see the people out on, on the poles and wires and they're big bucket trucks. And, and, and maybe you think something about them, maybe you don't, but at least you see them. Uh, the people you don't see mm -hmm. are the people, you know, in a, in a coal plant or a, a natural gas plant or whatever else that, that are working hard to, to make sure that that, uh, that electricity is coming and, and that we don't ever have brownouts. We don't ever have to have to worry about that. Mm. With the earthquake up in Salt Lake, did that really do some damage to some of those power plants for Rocky Mountain? Uh, there yeah, some so we, issues we have, there? We have very few uh, power plants in, in Salt Lake City uh, proper. So mo most of our power generation facilities um, are, are located in, in, in rural areas uh, across uh, Utah and, and as well in Wyoming. Um, so, so it didn't do, do much damage there. Uh, certainly sort of our poles and wires, our distribution system uh, that goes to people's homes, mm -hmm. there was damage. But we had that all, uh, our line workers had that all, all fixed and, and operational. Um, the, the earthquake occurred around 7 a.m. that morning. We had everybody up with power again by, by 10 o'clock that night. So um, it, it really is remarkable what they do. Um, you know, I, I always like to joke because with, with my family when they say, you know, hey, John, good work, get the power on. And it's you know, these hands here are doing it. It's, you know, I'm not the one on the bucket truck doing it, but uh, th those people, they, they, they do tremendous work. And, and, you know, whether it's an earthquake um, or, you know, think of the, the terrible weather that we have and your power goes out, you know, it's those people who are braving the, the snowy days and the cold winds and, and are up there 
you know, on a bucket truck out, out fixing your power. So they, they do tremendous work. Mm, yes, yes, they do. And we're so grateful for them. In your profession, how was it doing politics? Was it what you had thought it would be? Was it harder than you thought? Did you enjoy it? I mean, I guess there's a lot of different faces to politics. What did you think? Did you enjoy yeah. your time? I, I enjoy it. I, I love politics. I, I think it's great. I, I keep encouraging my 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 wife to serve. So we, we live up in, in Salt Lake City now. And, you know, I, I'm a Republican. My wife is a Democrat. So, you know, it leads to lots of... Oh, so how does that work? Yeah, it works. I, <laughs> good I get my... Good my, dinner my, conversations. <laughs> yeah, I get my, my lawn sign and then she gets her lawn sign and we, you know, disagree. You know, it's fine. But uh, I, I we, we live in a, a community now where... Uh, the Republicans are, are in the, the minority, so I, I keep encouraging her. I say, you know, hey, this would be a great time to, to, to run, and, and uh, I, I haven't prevailed on her just yet, but I, I enjoyed it. I, I love that I would recommend it to anyone. I think it's a tremendous experience. Uh, again, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, I, I would especially say, you know, in, in city government, uh, th th those are people that get criticized by their neighbors. You know, you go to the grocery store, mm -hmm. you go to, you know, church or wherever else, and and you'll get an earful from, from people about them thinking what, what oh, you should be doing in your job. But I bet, or it's your fault for this and that. <laughs> yeah, but, but the good news is, you know, despite that, there's also a lot of people out there that, that really appreciate what you do. And, and yeah. um, there's great people in Utah. You, you know, you think about it, we got 248 uh, cities and towns in the state, 29 counties. You think of all the city councils, all the mayors, all the county commissioners in each of those those communities and it takes a lot of people and, and I'm from a, a small town and uh, and again in Parowan you know where, where we moved another small town uh, you know these aren't people who are begging for the job you know these are people that your neighbors come to you and say hey you know we need you and and, and then Kevin's people you know agree and, and are willing to serve yeah and step up and do the job yes yes absolutely so a question will you ever write another book I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I like writing. Uh, for me, writing helps me um, solidify my thought. It helps me organize my thoughts. And so, you know, whether mm -hmm. or not it's writing for a book or, or some other purpose, you know, I, I do enjoy writing. So I got a, got a lot of life ahead of me, you know, got a lot of, a lot of things to learn. And so, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd certainly be open to that at some future point in time. Yes. And looking at Utah as a state, is there anything that you would personally change or something that you think that we could do better as a state? Sure. I, you know, you let me be king for a day. There's all sorts of things that <laughs> change. Uh, Great I, ideas. Yeah. No, I, <laughs> I think there's a lot of things uh, we can do. I, I, I think that having said that, um, it's it's easier to maybe think up a great idea. It's, it's really hard to, to actually follow through. It's not that dissimilar but uh, it's very dissimilar, but for the process of writing a book, everybody thinks, you know, I can write a book and whatever else. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. but, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of follow through and, and, uh, it's not that dissimilar from, from ideas, uh, as far as public policy is concerned. Um, y you can have uh, great ideas and, and those are important and, and you ought to try to try to push them forward. But if, if you want them to succeed, it takes time. My, my wife, she's a, a small business owner and, um, you know, it, she had a great business idea one day and decided she was going to start a business, but that was just the beginning. You know, it's really the e every day working through to pay the bills and, and to make things work. That's, that's where it happens. So Utah's not, not dissimilar. I, I think we've got a tremendous state. Um, you know, certainly the, the rankings nationally bear that out and show that, you know, we're, we're in a great position, uh, even now in, in this crisis, you know, there was an article today, I think on CNN that showed, you know, Utah was, I think, uh, in the bottom three as far as unemployment. Um, so our economy is still, you know, uh, strong despite the difficulty that we're in. Uh, but even even then, if just because you're doing better than the other 50 doesn't mean you you, you rest and 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 you think you're doing. Mm -hmm. just I, I think that you know we we've got to push ourselves to that next level. I I would love to see uh, tremendous uh, focus on rural Utah. I, I think that. Uh, you know, right now, yeah, it kind of gets left out sometimes, I think. Yeah, people forget about it, you know, um, and, and part of it is, you know, the, the, the Census Bureau comes out with uh, stats and, and, and proves that, you know, Utah is one of the most urban states in the nation. We don't we don't think of it that way. But, uh, you know, more than 90 percent of our people live on one percent of our land. And that's that little corridor there, the Wasatch Front. Oh, yeah. Wasatch Front. Yeah, but I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of places in rural Utah that, uh, that I think are poised for great success. I think the current crisis, 
uh, with COVID-19 is, is uh, re-emphasizing some, some needs to look at the way that's, that we, we approach our economy. I, I think that uh, the, the, the global supply chain that we've had, I'm, I'm a free market, free trade kind of guy. I think it's important that, that we continue to, to have that. But I, I think this crisis has shown us that we can't be completely dependent on other countries and other places. And I, I think it, it shows that we need to, to reemphasize uh, sort of our own homegrown manufacturing um, you know, America used to be a place where we built things. Now we're a place where we consume things. I, I think we need to get back to building some things. And, and, and you look at- You consume where, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you look at where, where things are built uh, or historically have been built. And, and rural Utah is where we build a lot of things. That's where we grow our food. That's where we, we build our energy. I mean, our energy comes from, from rural Utah. You, you ask the question, you know, hey, were, were your power plants hurt in the earthquake? And the answer is, Really no, because that's not where they're at. You know, they're they're, they're in rural mm -hmm. Utah, and, and that's where you know a lot of these things come from. And I, I think we'll we'll have some great opportunities as it relates to manufacturing as well moving forward. Hmm. So, John, do you think you'll ever run for political office again? I I I, I doubt it. I like I said, I'm <laughs> trying to get my wife to run. I uh, so I uh, we, we we see uh, kind of a loaded I, question. Maybe it's a maybe. Question to ask her. <laughs> I have the uh, I have the same last name as a uh, as a candidate for for statewide office in the state of Utah right now, and so we see billboards around sometimes or little yard signs out uh, for that individual. And and my my little girls, uh, I've got a 12 year old, a 10 year old, and a six year old. They love to to point out those signs. They say, "Hey, look, look!" And and every time I see one, I always say, or, or they say that I always say, you know, "Hey, that that's for you. You know, you're you're going to be governor someday." And and uh, you know, I I would love to I. I I obviously am a political junkie. I love being involved in politics. You know, if there's an opportunity, great. But but I would love to see a lot of other people involved too. And and someday, you know, I, I think that we need to get back to sort of our roots um, and, and see a lot more women involved in politics. And, you know, as a, a father of three, all girls, I, I think that's a great place to start. Oh, yes, I absolutely agree with you. So what have you besides this book that you've been writing and everything and studying all your history, what other books do you enjoy reading? What other books have had an effect on you, on your personal life, on your professional life? What books have influenced you? Yeah, so I, I like uh, nonfiction. So I'm a, a nonfiction guy. Um, I, I, I really like books that um, I don't expect the arguments that I read in the books. So kind of going back to that, what I said mm -hmm. before about, you know, my mom said I was born a contrarian. I, I really like sort of books that, that will challenge uh, my, my way of thinking about the world. And uh, whether or not I, I end up agreeing with sort of their arguments, it, it, it's interesting to me. So I, I've always enjoyed, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's always had some great, great books I've enjoyed. Uh, there's this really obscure writer who used to write like music reviews for some Midwest uh, newspaper. And I don't, I'm not even like a music guy, but he comes up with the most off the wall ideas. And I just love reading them. Uh, there's Chuck Klosterman's his name. So, I, you know, there's people that, uh, that like that, that uh, again, if, if you have contrarian ideas, uh, I, 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 I'll probably buy your book. So, you know, I, I am your target audience, I would say. Oh, that's awesome. With COVID-19 and your family, where you have the three kids, what have you guys been doing to keep yourselves entertained, to keep yourselves quarantined, to keep from going too crazy indoors? Do you have any good ideas for anybody of entertainment or things to, besides yeah. ice cream? <laughs> A lot of ice <laughs> That's cream. That's been my coping <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> I cope with food, yes. No, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that it's good advice for people. I, I would say that, you know, COVID-19, perhaps one of the the side effects is, is lapses in judgment as well. So we, we decided to get a puppy uh, in the middle of this crisis. We thought, you know, things are crazy. Our kids are stressed out. You know, why not take it to the next level? So, so we, we are certainly- That is uh, taking it to the next level. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, we're sorting through that uh, as, as best we can right yeah, now. Yeah, how's that going? <laughs> uh, so, so, what kind of a dog did you get? Uh, we got a, like a mini golden doodle. Uh, oh, okay, those are adorable. Yeah, my, my kids are super excited. You know, um, I, 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 I'm blessed with a very responsible 12 year old daughter. And so, you know, I, I Those are nice. Yeah, that, that's made life a lot easier. So if you don't have a responsible, you know, a kid, maybe think twice on that one. Mm, yes, I agree. Well, John, we were, we are running out of time, but thank you so much for coming on the community reads for us. Will you hold up your book again so we can see it again? Yeah, sure. Where are we able to get a copy of this book? 
yeah, if you just just go on to Amazon, you can you can pick up a copy there. So. All right, awesome. Utah Politics, Principles, Theories, and Rules of the Game by John Cox. John, thank you so much for coming on to Community Reads today. I'm sure enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, and good luck with everything. Thank with you. Rocky Mountain Power and maybe politics in the future and your family. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate it, and and I love Southern Utah. It, it was a great place to 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 live and and go to high school, and and my family loved it down there. So yeah, you're you're from a good place. Yeah, thank, oh, thank you, you for joining us <laughs> from all of us here at SEU Community Education. We hope you enjoyed learning something new today. You can watch this recording and all of our recordings at suu.edu slash keep learning or follow our YouTube channel at SEU Community Education. Thank you everybody for joining us today and have a great day.